killed a wife, married, divorced one, killed one, and then survived the last one. We remember all these things about Henry, but we forget the very young, pious, handsome, athletic, devout, and seemingly fair youth that uh, Europe had ever known as a monarch. And it's actually discovering this one that helps us understand the tyrant. And so now we're going to turn back the clock to 1409. So you might remember now uh, Lady Margaret Beaufort from the last talk. She was Henry VII's mother, and therefore Henry VIII's grandmother. And now this is her book of hours um, <clears throat> from the British Library. I got a, a copy of the scan. The book of hours was essentially a prayer book. It's modeled somewhat on the breviary, except that so the breviary that priests and religious uh, are, are bound by church law to pray. But the nobility did not keep the hours of the breviary. They'd been too lengthy for them. So instead, their book of hours had collections of prayers, hymns, and other types of colics from mass, other prayers that were th theirs for the day. Okay, and every day they, would, they had a calendar, and the, this calendar became like so many baby books with deaths, births, baptism dates, all noted. So this had passed, it's all hand embroidered and illuminated, usually in Antwerp or in Bruges. So this one had come down to Lady Margaret Beaufort, and she's noted down an important day. Actually, it rather wasn't an important day. So this is the day that Henry was born, and she's annotated it in heavily abbreviated Latin. Hic die isto, <clears throat> Henricus natus est, alius filius, so filius alius, a little abbreviation there, um, Henrici octavi, creatus est a patre suo, princeps wali. So there's two things we actually notice with this particular inscription. The first is she scratched out the date. Did she forget her own grandson's birth? Uh, did she mess it up? And in fact, but the next part tells us the rest of the story, created Prince of Wales by his father. Now when Henry was born, he was not Prince of Wales. So she wrote the actual date when this took place in uh, 1503, and then, realizing her mistake, starting to write the 15, she scratched it out to put Henry's actual birthday, 1491. That means that on his birthday, in her book of hours, Henry's birth was not even noted. Did, did she not care? It's actually because Henry was just the spare. Henry VII had come to the throne to end the Wars of the Roses, as we met, after ending the Wars of the Roses, as we mentioned previously, and he married Elizabeth of York. Their oldest son, however, was not Henry, but Prince Arthur. And so remember, we spoke of the Tudor Rose. It's a big, brilliant propaganda piece for Henry VII to show unity. We've restored unity and peace to the country, and now, like famous English restorations, we will have a King Arthur our very own King Arthur. And thus we all shall have a restored royal court. Henry, however, was rather unimportant because he was the spare, as we said. So Arthur was sent to Ludlow Castle in, in Wales, where, because English, uh, the heir to the throne is styled Prince of Wales. And the spare, usually, the second son, will be Duke of York. And, of course, Henry hadn't yet been given this title. So he goes to Ludlow Castle. He doesn't even know Henry. He's barely ever seen him. Instead, he gets the education of a king, which is in politics, Latin, the art of ruling, and so many other things that kings must know for the ruling of a country. Henry, on the other hand, is raised with his mother and with his sisters. And he's raised on tales of chivalry and hopes of knighthood and many other things. So he gets a very different upra upraising which teaches him the value of romance and of love. <clears throat> Henry, however, would get the chance to play the knight sooner than he thought. Um, we mentioned the last time the princes of the tower. So there is young Edward V, uncrowned, and Richard, his younger brother, the two princes in the tower, taken there by uh, their uncle, the Richard, the Lord High Protector, later Richard III, and as I mentioned, according to Thomas More's history, murdered there. But nobody really knew. 
So one day in Henry VII's reign, when Henry VIII, future Henry VIII, was only about four or five years old, a certain Flemish uh, model, more or less, Perkin Warbeck, was modeling clothes for some wealthy merchants in Cornwall. And they happened to notice he bore a slight resemblance to the Yorkist family, and especially to the young Richard. Even though he was not English at all, he was Flemish, that is, from what we today call Belgium. And the Yorkists took immediate notice and decided to make use of him to rebel against Henry VII. So in the, Perkin went along with the deception and proclaimed himself the Duke of York, or in this case, the counterfeit Duke of York. So he marched at the head of Cornish troops with Yorkish lords. It was one of the things that causes Henry VII to be very uh, suspicious, with, especially with anyone with Yorkish blood. And so eventually, you know, Henry then, the young Henry VIII, is taken to a ceremony where his brother's present, and he's formally made a Knight of the Garter. So you can imagine with what relish boys look at knights in shining armor and joust and how excited they'll get, even the plain knights, um, or at least used to be anyway. And Henry was no exception to this. Just in those days, just as today, a knight on the battlefield, this is the, the highest of, of, of military prowess. And we still have movies about knights. There, there's more coming out this year because it still hits a primordial nerve in our culture thinking about knights and knighthood. So for Henry, this is his great honor. He is now made a knight of the, arm, of the garter, swears the traditional oaths before his father, and then is sent quickly with his mother and, and sisters and Arthur into the tower for safekeeping. Henry VII manages to have his forces cut off the Cornish rebels on the other side of the Thames where they're massacred. And then Warbeck is taken prisoner, so then he is put in the tower uh, where he's going to be put to death rather than Henry. Henry also was created Duke of York, so now he's already a duke at age four. Now here is another uh, picture from his youth. Henry is about aged eight. In the background you see Elizabeth of York and there's around his sisters. This is actually his sister Mary, whom later Henry would marry to the French king, Louis XII. We'll actually talk about that a bit later. Um, Henry here, a young boy, it's his birthday. And he's received a visit. Can we, let's see, can we figure out who this is? Remember the portrait from the last talk? Anyone identify him? Erasmus, very good. This is Sir Thomas More. He's not Sir yet. This is young Thomas More, who has uh, contacts in the court, and he's come for Henry's birthday. Henry is now going to receive a whole booklet of poems that Thomas More has written for him, glorifying him, his father, his whole house, and Erasmus has come along with him. This is 1499, all right? And of course, Erasmus, this is his first to coming to England. He doesn't speak English. He never actually learns to speak English. So he, he, all his conversation is taking place in Latin or in French. So he comes to the court of the young Henry VIII and uh, has no gift to give because Moore didn't forewarn him. And Erasmus writes a letter of complaint to Lord Montjoy, their mutual friend, that, oh, the cur, he didn't even tell me. Right? It says in a loving way. But uh, <laughs> So then at dinner, Henry challenges Erasmus to write up some poems on the spot. And Erasmus spends two days uh, diligently hurrying to write off some poems so as to give to the young Henry. And so this is uh, actually the first encounter of Moore with Henry, and there would be various other ones. So this is also, uh, this, this is a much later picture, obviously, Henry at prayer. But this in the center is Henry VIII's bead roll. And he's written a note up here, which actually carries over from the previous side of the roll. Um, I didn't... Uh, collect that one, but he's basically telling his body servant, pray, I pray now that you would do good unto me uh, as a loving master. Yours, Henry, that is his body servant, who takes care of him and manages all of his affairs. So this bead roll was a roll of cloth rolled up in Roman style, and it was made for, actually, for adolescents to learn their prayers from. So obviously here, uh, the risen Christ, and you have prayers in Latin, because they have to learn Latin, telling them, instructing them with the greatest elements of medieval piety to pray to the resurrected Christ and have the hope of the resurrection in your hearts and you will receive these favors. And over here, we see what would have been a white enameled body of Christ is oxidized, so now it's dark, and the bodies of the other thieves are black okay, from oxidization. And you have prayers to the crucifix, which promises you things like we see today in our prayers 
The difference being that medievals believe them and we only half believe them. If you say these prayers, you will be delivered from fire and you will be delivered for you won't die a death of uh, drowning or strangulation. You won't die before your time and other things of this sort. And so these were the prayers that Henry grows up with. So the bead rule has the formation of his piety as well as hymns that he would learn to sing as a child, especially the Marian antiphons and many other things. <clears throat> Now, Henry was 12 when he first met Catherine of Aragon on her wedding day, but he was not the groom. It was rather his older brother, Arthur. Catherine was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, the great kings of, and queen of Spain. They were both monarchs in their own right, which is why their thrones were perfectly equal, Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. So Catherine was their youngest daughter and the dynastic sense of the marriage was for an alliance with England against France. France had been a big power in Europe and had invaded Italy several times. So European opinion was moving toward opposing the rise, the further rise of France. So the sensibility of this, since the Spanish were often at war with the French, was to have England on its side to harass the French from the north, while they would fight from the south. And this, of course, would be pursued throughout the rest of the 16th century. Catherine then was married to Arthur, and they went to Ludlow Castle, which after six months, Arthur died. And then there was, her situation became very uncertain. She became the Princess Dowager with no legal standing in England, and Henry VII decided to renegotiate the marriage with his younger son, Henry, and who was very young, but also thought her very beautiful and very much was in love with her. Now, Ferdinand had not yet made the payments on her dowry, and he ha was also kind of, you know, dragging his feet on fulfilling his end of the bargain. So Henry VII wasn't really sure he wanted Henry to marry Catherine, and even orders Henry, in pain of mortal sin, in his displeasure, to declare that, that he didn't want to marry Catherine, simply to satisfy, put pressure on Ferdinand to pay up. Meanwhile, Catherine can barely afford servants. She doesn't speak English, she only speaks Spanish. In Latin, she doesn't know exactly what's gonna happen. Now, she of course had a brilliant education as monarchs would have in Latin, but with the church fathers and other matters in religion, which appealed more to Isabella, rather than to uh, romance and other things that you would expect that we would kind of associate with Spanish monarchy, maybe. And so she doesn't see courtly romances and and sh uh, tales of chivalry, say, the way, say, Ignatius of Loyola and other knights in his class had seen it. She instead is instructed with theology, which appealed to Isabella. And although th this would actually play into Catherine's attitudes later in the marriage. So, but nevertheless, Henry VII dies, 1509. Henry becomes king, and his very first act as king is to marry Catherine for love. So they have a joint coronation. Henry puts off his own coronation so that way he can be jointly crowned with his queen, Catherine. So on the day, they process through London and she, of course she had her, bra her hair down in braids that could be seen through her veil, and which was the custom for Spanish princesses. And Henry's coronation wound its way to Cheapside, one of the uh, old major boroughs of the London Town Council. And there, Thomas More was chosen to represent the city of London. Moore was a lawyer, and he was also an undersheriff for London, and had represented the city in many dealings, and he was their favorite go-to man, because he was also an intellectual, and his Latin was flawless, brilliant. And he writes these poems for Henry's coronation, and that's an original book that's preserved at the British Library. It was delivered to Henry. <clears throat> Has anyone ever heard Henry VII called the Winter King? And who's ever studied the, this period of history? The, the term itself comes from Thomas More. And it comes actually from this collection of poems. So as Henry's coronation wound its way around Cheapside, more than addressed Henry for 15 minutes in flawless Latin, which Henry could understand, being trained again in the traditional discipline. And more declared, now ends the reign of the winter king. Now is the end of our sorrow. Now ends our tears, which instead are lifted up to the sun of glory. For this is a golden age. Our king loveth not gold or jewels, but virtue and immortality. But for how long? Well, we'll find out. Henry then became ruler in his own right at age 18, but 
he inherited the same privy council that his father had had, and they were definitely at odds with Henry's new policies. Henry comes to the throne with the image of the warrior king. So remember, he's knighted at age four, and he's grown up with the ideas of chivalry, but he's never allowed to actually do anything. When he was a youth, his father had forbade him from, tilt, from uh, the tilt yard, from jousting, from riding with the lance and picking the rings and other things, because it was far too dangerous. He might get killed, and then what of the succession? So he had to sit it out. But Henry had also spent time making friends with major Yorkists at the lists, and thus when he became king, they were his friends and not his enemies. So now he comes as a warrior king to emulate Edward III and Henry V, the great warrior kings of the Middle Ages, and conquer France. But he has to contend with the peace party, clergymen. So here is Bishop William Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Richard Fox, the Bishop of Winchester, at least at this time. Both uh, Winchester, uh, Warham is the Lord High Chancellor, the highest office in the state, and Fox is the Lord Privy Seal. So now, one of the things it is, Henry's first act is to start giving out offices and giving, as he loves giving titles and, and bestowing things upon people, the opposite of what his father did. So now, they put the halt on him. Uh, uh, if you're going to do that, you have to have the go the course of the seals. That way it becomes a legal act. Now, the course of the seals originates with King Henry II, the same Henry II that kills Thomas of Becket, by the way. He establishes this as a bit of legal procedure, but it's largely convention. Henry signs a grant or a deed or any kind of legal title, and then he seals it with his bulla, and then it goes to the Lord High Chancellor, who makes a copy, has a seal prepared, then signs it with his bulla, then it goes to the Lord Privy Seal, who signs it with his, and the act becomes law. So with this method, they had stopped all of Henry's attempts to raise troops and, and uh, prepare, for, um, prepare for war with France. And so he didn't like direct confrontation. Even though he was very tall, six feet, and he had a broad chest, he was extremely athletic, he was cowed into obedience by his father, who could be a very terrifying person, and as a result, he was very non-confrontational. This would actually last throughout his life, in spite of how tyrannical he could be at various times. So he doesn't want to fight. Instead, he goes out to his country palaces and relishes life with his new bride, <clears throat> Catherine. And he writes to Ferdinand, his father-in-law, saying that if we, every day we esteem her inestimable virtues, and if now we were free, we would choose none but her for now. So also he gets into reveling. So now, speakers? All right. So now this is a song. Henry was also a composer, as well as, a, in, as taking part in huntings and jousting and other things. And so he composed this song, if it will play. There we go. Who shall me let? Let, in early modern English, has the exact opposite meaning as it does today. So, he's declaring, I will do what I want. And, for my comfort, for my heart is set on goodly sport, or in other words, who is going to stop me? I am king, after all. And so Henry begins lashing out against his privy council. In 1511, his son is born, christened Henry, and in honor of it, he has a great joust. He dies, unfortunately, a month later <clears throat> in youth. Very great disappointment. But in the meantime, Henry prepares a joust, and with his scrum of the stool, Nicholas Carew goes out in disguise as a knight and prepares to fight the joust. So during the, the tournament, and one of the knights is knocked over. Now somebody in the audience who was in on the secret suddenly declared, God save my lord the king. And the whole crowd was, was a nervous, 
a nervous wreck. Is the king dead? What happened to the king? So Henry was obliged to take off his helmet to reveal that he was perfectly safe amidst great cheers. But more importantly, especially people in court were noticing that Henry was now at odds with his privy council. And one of the first to notice was one Thomas Wolsey. Wolsey was the son of an Ipswich butcher who also ran an inn. Now, in the actual rules, you can still see them today in the Ipswich uh, Council, the, uh, they list Wolsey's father as running an unclean house. In the case you're not familiar with that jargon, it means he ran a brothel. And so the profit was sufficient where he would be risk running on the wrong side of the law every year and take the fine in order to get the profits he got from this. So Wolsey, to escape this life that is going to be his if he doesn't do something, runs to the grammar schools run by the monks. The church in this time provided education for free. And Wolsey then, taking on the course we described in our talk on John Fisher, learns Latin very brilliantly. He's a very bright student. And at uh, Oxford, takes on eventually holy orders and becomes an almoner in Henry's court under Bishop Richard Fox. Now, when Henry began going retiring to his estates, Fox demanded that Wolsey keep an eye on him, try to curb his ambitions for war. And Wolsey, in the beginning, starts to do this. But Wolsey suddenly sees that the way to power is to give Henry exactly what he wants. And this is precisely what he does. In the course of events, Wolsey discovers that the course of the seals is mere convention and shows Henry the way around it. They give some insignificant grant to some lord somewhere, and Warham challenged it, for it hadn't gone in the course of the seals. Wolsey appeared directly with an order for the king, challenging it, and declared to him legally he could not with the seals could not withstand a direct command from the king. It was undone. And Warham wrote a note on this particular bull, uh, saying, So says the aforementioned Master Wolsey. Warham resigns from the post of Lord High Chancellor, afraid of what's going to happen next, not wanting to be a party to any wars. And then Henry appoints Wolsey in his place to Lord High Chancellor. Eventually, he would rise to become Cardinal and the Pope's personal representative in England, the Cardinal Legatine. So in the meantime, 1513, Wolsey's appointment and his great uh, energy allows Henry to enter the Italian wars on the side of the Pope. And this is where the history gets very convoluted and very complicated. Pope Julius II, as we mentioned, comes to the papacy, uh, which has an empty treasury, lost lands and titles from the times in which the popes were living in Avignon, and a desire to recover them and emulate Julius Caesar, rather than Pope St. Julius I, the early church martyr. And as he's made war in Italy, his enemies are being sponsored by the Republic of Venice, which always had a tradition of siding against the papal interest. And when we say the papal interest, we mean in politics, not so much in religion. So the state of Venice is basically at odds with the Pope, and Julius declares war, and he forms what's called the League of Cambrai, or all of Europe against Venice. So he pulls in the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I, as well as Louis XII of France, and he attempts to get Henry of England. <clears throat> in the first days, Henry wasn't able to do it because of his privy council, whereas in Spain and everyone else was into the fight. Well, then something interesting happens right around the time of what we just talked about with Wolsey and surviving and Henry coming into his own finally. Venice doesn't about face. The French are going beyond uh, what the Pope had told them they should do. Now they were not just invading the Veneto, they were invading papal territory. Venice does not about face. They come to Julius hat in hand and say, can't we switch sides? How about everyone against the French instead of everyone against us? <laughs> and Julius takes the switch. So now the League of Cambrai is renegotiated. All of Europe against France. The King of France was Louis XII. And he had uh, many victories in his youth, but now was very old. Henry was very young, a great, youthful, vigorous monarch. And of course, his father-in-law, Ferdinand of Aragon, was king over the greatest empire the world had ever seen. That is, the Spanish Empire with its gold from the New World. So, in 1513, Henry invades France, taking the cities of Terroir and Tournai. 
And then Ferdinand is supposed to, coming through Nevers, attack France from the south and keep their forces busy. Ferdinand doesn't quite do that. In fact, he tarries in Nevers, takes Nevers to, to the better part of Nevers to be Spanish, uh, throws the queen, Jane d'Albrecht, into the northern parts of uh, Nevers, which uh, she's not very happy about. So this is why you have Spanish Basques and French Basques, by the way, it's because of that. But he never quite makes his way into France. Henry, on the other hand, defeats the French at Tarouin at a great battle where the French cavalry attempted to relieve the city by throwing sides of bacon over the castle walls. Henry's men set upon the troops and routed them. And to make matters worse, the English named the battle after the glittering sp spurs on the French cavalry as they rode away, the Battle of the Spurs. Henry had this made into a tapestry from whence this picture comes, and he used to enjoy sitting the French ambassador facing it. <laughs> On the other hand, he left Catherine in England as queen regent. Catherine was made to rule. She was the daughter of a warrior queen and had ambitions herself to be a warrior queen likewise. And so while Henry was away, King James IV had invaded from Scotland. Now James IV was also married to Henry's sister Margaret, but this didn't stop him from trying to take advantage of Henry's absence. But then comes the Battle of Flodden. And the troops that Catherine had arranged and paid for under the Duke of Surrey had crushed the Scots and killed the king, James IV of Scotland. And Catherine thus delivered her royal arms to Henry. Henry now comes as a victorious monarch, holding most of northern France south of Cali, and has grand plans for building up Tournai. And he actually, there's a tower still there. If you're ever in Tournai in France, you can see the tower. It's actually Les Tours de Henri, oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, my French is terrible. And the Tower of Henry VIII, you could see it there, is posted, and it's a really grand ambition. But then Henry discovers that the cost is just too high. And he can't manage it. On top of that, Ferdinand never finished his part of the bargain and still hasn't actually paid all of Catherine's dowry. So Henry gets extremely frustrated. So even though for a moment Catherine was his companion governing the kingdom, now Henry's not terribly happy with her father, so they do an about face. Henry marries his sister, Mary, to Louis XII, makes peace with the French, and even plots possibly a war against Spain. How quickly it all pass, you know, passes around, there's a great political dalliance of every single ruler against every other one throughout this half of the century. So that comes to nothing, however. Louis XII dies, and uh, Mary is returned to England as the Queen Dowager of France, and then she's married to another English lord. And she's a great-grandmother of Lady Jane Grey, for instance. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So St. Thomas More, now we've mentioned More, he's appeared enigmatically throughout different things. Uh, More was born in London, he's a native Londoner, Right, he's about 15 years older than Henry. Right? So he's also a brilliant student, great patron of the Renaissance. So in his night, spare hours between studying law and becoming expert in law, he's also an intellectual, studying great thinkers and in the great company of Erasmus, Lord Mountjoy, Estoppé uh, de um, Lefebvre, and other great famous reformers all around Europe, more blossoms into a, into a great peer of other young intellectuals, the greatest of which was his daughter, Margaret. Now this is a family portrait from 1530, when he's in the midst of very great trouble. But in the meantime, anyway, his, Thomas More takes the very radical decision to educate his daughter, Margaret, in an age where women were rarely, if ever, educated. And the logic of educating women did not appear even to the greater intellectuals. More took the view more like Plato in Plato's Republic, where he's, Plato's the ancient Greek philosopher suggests that women and men should be educated together, ideally because he's considering the soul, not the body and social convention and other things. So More takes a leaf out of that book and educates his daughter. And so, ironically, his daughters become extremely well-educated. His son, rather taciturn and lazy and not so uh, skilled in books, becomes a clerk. But his daughter, Margaret, excels in the classics. Unfortunately, Moore's business had kept him away very often. And so he managed to establish a school at home and correct their Latin from afar. 
Right? And so one of the things that was done was the teaching of rhetoric, which again, no one in that time would have taught their daughters rhetoric. It wouldn't have seemed to make any sense because there's no outlet for it. Women can't go into court, women can't be lawyers, but Moore did so anyway. And so the challenge was to be a true rhetorician, to write, translate a, something out of Latin into English. Now translate it back into Latin. Now give your oration in court, and then determine whose speech was the more winning. And so various educational games, from the earliest readings of Aesop's fables to reading Cicero and many other writers, would challenge Margaret Moore's intellect, and she would grow in it, to the point where she would publish her own book and become the very first woman in English history to publish her own book. And this was a translation, well, it wasn't her own writing, but it was her own translation of Erasmus's commentary on the Lord's Prayer by a virtuous and well-learned gentlewoman of, <clears throat> of, of mature age. And there's a picture that's not supposed to be her as much as to be any anonymous mature gentlewoman. And Margaret Moore, indeed, publishes the book, and there is an outcry. She published a work on theology with no ecclesiastical license. And she's a woman. It has never been heard of before. And there is a row in the English church. So Moore runs to Wolsey to license the work, which he does. So the second edition bears Wolsey's arms on it. But it was something that even Moore realized this had gone just a bit too far. Maybe it was the time to walk it back a bit. The tragedy is it's written in beautiful, fluent English for that time. It really was something of a pioneering lesson. But it was the wrong time. The, the right thing, but at the wrong time. Nevertheless, Moore was extremely brilliant in law as he was in learning. He's most famous for writing Utopia, okay, which is an interesting work of philosophy. It's one of those books you, you know, generally you read once and you probably don't read again, and unless you read it in Latin and then you're interested in the Latin and you keep going over it. But it's a fictional story about an island of inhabitants that have nothing but natural reason to guide them. How would they make their government? What would they do? And it's a pre-Christian type of culture that he's kind of envisioned in this fake world of utopia. And that term becomes what we mean it to be when we use that word utopia. It didn't mean that back then. It's just a fictional name that he gives to the island. It actually means nowhere, frankly, in Latin. So uh, you can read more about that. Uh, there's pl various places to read more about utopia. You can find it online for free in other places. Um, anyway, so Moore, because of his legal acumen, especially in solving a major trade problem around the times we've been talking about between London, the Pope, and uh, various Flemish and F Florentine merchants, where the Pope had these fields of alum in the, in the north, these mines where alum was very important for dyeing your clothes. Alum would cling to the fabric and keep the dye so that it wouldn't wash out. So it was an extremely important uh, mineral, plus for other things too. It is mostly found in Italy or in the Middle East, so the cheaper route is from Italy, but the Pope owns it. Now, various Florentine merchants were actually ripping the Pope off, unbeknownst to the English, and selling it at uh, knockdown rates to Henry. So Henry had given them a, a special pass from City of London tolls. Well, that didn't make the local guilds happy or the City of London. The Pope wasn't happy. It was a big mess. Moore manages to fix it all with a legal piece of legal writing. It was so brilliant that the actual negotiator for it all, Cuthbert Tunstall, looked at it and said, just do what Moore said. And thus, Moore had come to Henry's intention, attention. The Pope was happy, the merchants were happy, and Henry was happy. So he comes to visit Thomas More, this famous scene from Man for All Seasons, and invite him to become a privy counselor. Interestingly, Moore would always remain a very shrewd judge of character, and he all, he'd marked Henry even from when Henry was a boy. Writing to his son-in-law, William Roper, Moore says, Believe me, son Roper, if my head would win him a castle in France, it should not fail to fall. So he knows already in 1516 the dangers of life in court. But it's also an important position for his large and growing family, so Moore takes the job. There's also a tradition that he and his wife didn't get along. It's actually not true. It's rather that his scholars that were friends of Moore's didn't get along with her. She was a very astute woman, a woman that you didn't mess with. But she was street smart, whereas Moore was book smart. And it was something Moore sorely needed in terms of he had his affairs all a mess. She came in and arranged them and made them orderly. But he passionately loved her as well. And the tradition of them not getting along comes from friends of Moore's that found her not willing to open up the purse strings for them and from the fact that she swore the royal supremacy and Moore did not. But 
in any event. So moving on. So Louis XII dies, and now a new, young, energetic Frenchman comes to the throne of France, Francois I. He's a Renaissance-educated prince, unlike Louis XII. He is into the new learning, and he decides to bring the Renaissance to France. And so he finds an Italian painter wanted in Florence for homosexuality, namely one Leonardo da Vinci, who brings with him the Mona Lisa, which is why today it's in the Louvre and not somewhere in Italy, is that he brings it to Francis Francois's court. He designs siege engines for him, including a robot lion that walks and presents flowers and all these other interesting little devices. Francois calls Henry's bluff. Henry, after defeating the French, posed as the arbiter of Europe. And he declared, if the French go to Italy, it will be if we say so. And if we say not, they will not go. Francois called his bluff, went to Italy, and made Julius II sign a deal with him. So Henry now could no longer pose as the, uh, the arbiter of Europe. Hen War just wasn't in Henry's cards. He didn't have a budget for it. But peace, well... Pope Leo X, as we mentioned last time, the first Medici Pope was diametrically opposed to his predecessor, except perhaps in the patronage of the arts. Leo decides what we need is European peace so we can have a crusade against the Turks. So he wants peace, and Henry decides he will make his mark on the European stage by posing as the Prince of Peace. So he and Wolsey work out how it is that they will do this. And so they talk to Francois about a peace summit. Let's have peace, and we'll have a big European summit. Let's invite all the ambassadors. It'll be a talk of Europe for years. Let's do it. But meanwhile, as the negotiations for this peace summit come along, a new, even younger monarch enters the scene of Western Europe, Charles V. Charles is the son of Catherine of Aragon's older sister, Juana, and uh, the son of Maximilian I, Philip the Fair of Burgundy. As a result, he's born Duke of Burgundy and the Lord of Flanders. Flanders being both Belgium and the Netherlands, what we today call those two countries. Very rich and very wealthy, we might add. Through his grandmother and grandfather, Ferdinand and Isabella, he is an heir to Spain, as his father was. His father dies very young, and he becomes king of Spain, king of Naples, and Sicily, and Milan. And if that's not enough, Charles, the first of Spain, sees all this gold from the New World and says, well, I can be Holy Roman Empire Emperor just like my grandfather. And he uses the gold to pay off the electors and thus becomes Holy Roman Emperor. In other words, he is now nearly the Lord of Europe except for France. So eventually, Charles and Francois would fight. Which one would England back? Because England would have to choose. Henry chose Charles, but why not a little pageantry in the meantime? So he still goes to France and sets up the Field of the Cloth of Gold. This is still a painting in Whitehall. I believe it's in Whitehall, unless I'm mistaken, in the Queen's collection. This was painted. This was the Great Peace Summit established by Henry in 1523. The only time St. John Fisher ever left England was at this event where he came as the chaplain to Queen Catherine. Thomas More was also there, and various ambassadors tried to pluck from Thomas More what it was all really about, what was going on. But More was found to be tight-lipped, because where Henry's affairs were concerned, or any affairs of state, or any secret at all, More was always discreet. So the English set up this temporary palace here in a, in a feat that easily defeats the French. They have many tents made of cloth of gold. It's a rich and sumptuous affair. There's a tilt yard for the English and the French knights to joust against each other. There's sport and games, and the English general's successes get ruined when Henry challenges Francois to a wrestling match, which he loses. Francois was 6'3", Henry was 6'1", and the height was enough for Francois to overturn Henry. Nevertheless, before it's all done, there was the swearing of perpetual peace. And the Venetian ambassador noted, these two men hate each other, cordially. <laughs> Henry swore perpetual peace to Francois I of France. And then, after it was all done, and all the pageantry lost and Picardy returned to dust, Henry goes to meet the Emperor Charles V and promised to make war on France the next year. <laughs> 
St. John Fisher, who was present at the event, noted in a long sermon, which touched upon many things, but begins speaking after talking about the arraignment and the glory of all the lords who were there. He says, <clears throat> Our eye has seen many pleasures, many happy sights, many wonderful things that hath appeared and seemed unto us joyous and comfortable. But yet all these were but counterfeits of the true joys. All these were but dull and dark images of the perfect comfort which the blessed saints have now above in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he was not particularly impressed. Charles, in getting prepared to make war on France, found himself in a new problem. His affairs in Germany, his, more, his demands for heavier taxation on the Cortef in Castile, as well as Aragon, his taking money from the New World meant for Spain over to Germany to fight the French, was irritating the Spanish nobles. And after he had rebuffed the request for regress of taxation, they say, let's fight for it. And they established the common era, or loosely translated, the Brotherhood. And the work of the Brotherhood was to put Henry, uh, Charles's mother, Juana, on the throne as a figurehead, and in the meantime, search for another king. And so they also extended to Nevers, where Charles's unhappy Basque subjects were looking to revolt, and they invite the French. The French, only too happy to go help in Charles's misfortune, come in and invade at Pamplona, where, in taking the city, one Spanish captain gets the nerve of all the rest of them to fight, and then as the shot falls, He's struck in the leg, ramparts fall down, and we know him as Ignatius of Loyola, at that time Inigo de Loyola. So he was, uh, so inadvertently, all these affairs create the Jesuits for the next, <laughs> inadvertently. <laughs> but in the meantime, nearer to home, Charles has no way to get to Spain to quell the revolt, because he's got to cross the Pyrenees, which are all under French control, so he goes to England hat in hand. The Holy Roman Emperor, Lord of the World, he's out of money, and he doesn't have any ships. Henry does, in abundance. Henry, in many ways, is the founder of the Royal Navy. He invented new technologies and brought merchants from abroad to establish new ships that were stronger than the French ships, had more firepower, and were faster. So, Charles comes to England and promises the moon. He'll betroth himself to Henry's only daughter, Mary. He will pay annually all the money that's already owed for previous endeavors and pay thousands and thousands of dollars uh, in our money, millions of dollars, thousands of pounds and crowns of gold. And he'll make war with France next year. We'll partition France. He'll work to make Wolsey the next pope. And all these things, you know, whatever it's got to be, just get me to Spain, please. And he does. And Henry loans him the money, loans him the ships. They drop Charles off. And the Duke of Surrey launches his offensive against the French to keep Charles safe. Charles dithers and doesn't come through on his end of the deal. Now, he promised the moon, but getting it was far more elusive. Catherine of Aragon, Henry married for love and had great romance with her. But as she failed in the office as royal baby maker, with frequent miscarriages and her only surviving child being a daughter, much to Henry's disappointment, although he did love Mary, and he did dote on Mary in this period, but she wasn't a son. So, Moore's prophecy in the coronation procession that Catherine would be the mother of kings seemed more and more fleeting. By 1518, she was growing fatter, and to Henry's mind, ugly. She doesn't look so bad here, but she's becoming what we now call frumpy, whereas Henry was still in good condition. He was still very young, still very handsome, still the talk of Europe, and she's less attractive to him. On top of that, the dynastic reasoning for her marriage has not really worked out in Henry's favor, so they've gradually been growing apart. Catherine devoting herself more to religion, Henry to sport and jousting, and every once in a while to the care of government, which Wolsey mostly manages, and Wolsey mostly manages it by banishing faction at court by making sure courtiers are kept away from the business of government so that he alone can control the reins, all of which gets shattered by the arrival of Anne Boleyn, but that's for tomorrow. Catherine, then, in 1525, when this is all going on, is a far less attractive spouse. She's actually described as being as round, as wide as she is tall, although that's an exaggeration by the Venetian ambassador, but certainly she was not very thin, and it's not her fault. Being out constantly pregnant from 1509 to 1518, she's not going to have uh, stayed in very good condition. 
Henry then starts looking elsewhere. But now, Charles coming and promising the moon seems to fulfill the dynastic logic of her marriage. And again, she's now in uh, decisions of government. She's now important, whereas before she was not. Catherine then is excited, but could Charles deliver? And this was the increasing question. 1523, the Duke of Surrey hits the field. As far as Agincourt, Charles never materializes. In 1524, Henry again launches an invasion into France and gets within striking distance of Paris. Charles IV, or V doesn't appear. Maybe next year, he says. Henry, increasingly worn out, bankrupt, and not having received much money, made a formal protest to the Spanish ambassador and decided to sit 1525 out. Charles didn't. And in 1525, the Battle of Pavia took place. Charles is victorious, Francois I taken prisoner, and now the chance to partition France is there, and Henry had no troops in the field. Oops. So Henry writes a letter to Charles immediately declaring all the crimes of the Valois dynasty. And now is the time, surely, for God's punishment to be enacted on them, for France to be dismembered and the Valois put out of its misery. Charles, who's just defeated a powerful rival, has no intention of creating another one. Therefore, he calls Henry's bluff. If you want your part of France, you'll have to come and conquer it. Henry very quickly realizes his weak position and calls a parliament. He doesn't have enough money. Parliament is not in a mood to give him more funds as the taxation is still being paid off from the last expenditure of military might from the year before. So Wolsey has to come up with a new idea. So he comes up with a forced loan. A forced loan in English law is when you declare all the nobility must pay a certain amount. It's like a war bond in reverse. Uh, the government demands you pay and we'll pay you back eventually, except in English law, you didn't get a return, so it wasn't a, quite like a war bond. But you had to pay, or you went to the tower. So under circumstances like that, you were likely to do it. So Wolsey, as spin doctor in chief, renames it Amicable Grant. <laughs> it was anything but amicable. And not only was the uprising in the nobility, but even county, eastern counties in England suffering under taxation were ready to revolt. Henry had to back away. He could not conquer France. So all his attempts, everything he wanted to do, ended in failure. He was not going to be the new Edward III or the Henry V. And if he died right now, he would have been yet another English monarch who tried to make it in the European stage and failed. And he doesn't. So tomorrow, we'll take up all the... the oh, I forgot. There's one more element. I'm not ready for tomorrow yet. On top to add insult to injury, when Henry is unable to take his part of France, Charles decides he's powerful enough. He doesn't need Henry anymore. So he breaks the betrothal with Mary. Now, you've got to remember, this is kind of awkward anyway. Mary was six. This is Mary Tudor. She was six. Charles was 26. And on top of that, they're cousins. So the papal dispensations come in and all that stuff. So not because, remember, he's uh, Ferdinand and Isabella's grandson. She's... Isabella and Ferdinand's granddaughter through different lines. So that's kind of odd to us, normal for dynastic situations. But Charles jilts her, humiliates Henry, breaks the treaty, and disgraces Catherine. So now for Henry, there's no reason why he should be married to this woman. And he's looking further afield. Could he, if he could just get rid of Catherine, what could he do? Perhaps a French princess. Perhaps the point is that it didn't really matter who. It would have been someone. It just happened to be Anne. And in 1526, Anne appears at court and is considered a real dynamo, although Henry doesn't seem to notice just yet. When he does notice, we'll take up tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, when Henry married Catherine? Yeah. She was six years older than Henry was. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know how much, even though she got. Yeah. That was later. She, and so she's in her 40s in 1520.